Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn for the last of his morning briefings when he looks at how the Battle of Amiens triggered a series of Allied offensives that brought the war with Germany to an end just a few months later in November 1918. The war ended very quickly and very suddenly. People were genuinely surprised. On the 8th of August, it was a comparatively limited advance. And for most people, the expectation was still the end of the war in 1919. When you look back on it, you could blame the generals for not realising that victory was imminent. Actually, the problem was the politicians, including Lloyd George himself, because they had been so used to hearing reports of victories, imminent breakthroughs, chances of success in 1916, 1917, that when the generals started saying, we think we might win the war and we might win it sooner than you've been expecting, their response was, you said this before, guys, why should we take you seriously now? Given that Germany controls territory from here to Russia, from the Balkans to the Baltic, and that right up until the armistice on the 11th of November, Germany is still fighting well inside France. The victory is in many ways a surprise. The US Army, by the 11th of November 1918, is two million men strong. It's just becoming the strongest army on the Western Front. But it's not yet the four million men they're expecting by June 1919, which is when they expect the victory to be delivered. Now, what happens here on the Western Front after Amiens is essentially more integration of arms, of the use of air power, not so much the use of tanks, which really shot their bolt on the 8th and 9th of August, but the use of fire and movement, the ability to maintain the momentum, and above all, as throughout the First World War, the use of artillery. But what happens now is that artillery bombardments can be short, mounted with very little preparation because there are enough guns and enough shells and enough science behind the business of gunnery to deliver fire on the target. And what that means is you can integrate fire and movement much more effectively. Somme in 1916, long bombardment, seven days, and then an infantry advance. When the Hindenburg Line is broken at the end of September 1918, the Hindenburg Line is the strong defensive positions which the Germans had formed and to which they had retreated when they had fallen back in March 1917, and to which they retreat again in 1918. When the Hindenburg Line is broken, it follows an intense bombardment over 24 hours in which Rawlinson's army delivers as many shells in that one day as they delivered in 1916 over seven days. And the Allies could do that not just on one sector, but the whole length of the front, from the sea, to the Swiss border. Much of what we're doing, the other armies are also doing. The French army has gone through its learning experience. And in the north, the Belgians liberate their own country under King Albert, beginning with what we now call the Fifth Battle of Ypres. And in the south, September to November, the Americans launching their own offensive in the Meuse Argonne which extraordinarily has evaporated from American memory, but in which the daily loss of life is probably as intense as anything in the Civil War and certainly more intense than anything in the Second World War. That is their Somme or Verdun, if you want to put it in those terms. Foch's achievement is to coordinate these effects so that these offensives up and down the Western Front are sequential, one integrating with the other, so there is an overall design with the national armies doing their own thing operationally and tactically, but with a coordinated effect, they are trying to achieve strategic objectives, freeing lines of communication, 
and gathering in the industrial resources which the Allies need to be able to continue the war. Now, when Erich Ludendorff fled Germany after the German defeat and went into exile in Switzerland, he wrote his memoirs, which, like most people's memoirs, was a way of justifying what he'd been doing. Erich Ludendorff is the first quartermaster general of the German army, the sidekick to Hindenburg. Ludendorff described the 8th of August as the black day of the German army. And it's therefore been very easy to say 8th of August leads straight to the armistice. But in fact, what happened was there was no straight line. On the 13th of August, the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, convened a crown council in Spa. The Austro-Hungarian chief of the general staff came and said, we need an armistice. So he was reflecting the situation in the east, not in the west. And the German generals, the German Supreme Command, turned around and said, no, we don't. We can carry on fighting. We have to fight with a view to producing a situation where we can negotiate a satisfactory settlement. So although there is a recognition that the war now needs to be brought to an end, the Germans are still hopeful of negotiating that end in terms which are acceptable to them. When Ludendorff said the 8th of August 1918 was the black day of the German army, the worst day of the war for me, he then said, except for one other thing, the unraveling of the Quadruple Alliance between Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. At the end of September, something very dramatic happens far away from here in Macedonia, what is essentially now Greece. There, the Allies mount an offensive in the middle of September, aimed principally at the Bulgarian army, and achieve a very rapid breakthrough. Immediately, the Bulgarians ask for support from the German army. The problem the Germans are confronting at the end of September 1918, remember the Allies here have just broken through the Hindenburg Line, is shuttling troops up and down the Western Front, and they have nothing left over to give to other fronts. The Bulgarians ask for seven divisions, and the Germans say, tough, we cannot deliver them. That's on the 16th of September. Not only can they not deliver them in terms of having the men, they probably even couldn't have got there. Because the other problem, as a result of the expansion of the German Empire by 1918, is the transport systems collapsed. The railways have been overextended and under-maintained. So actually moving them would have been very difficult. Then, at the end of September, the Bulgarians seek an armistice. So this is the first of the Allies on the Central Powers side deciding to get out of the war. And that is the point the coalition collapses. They don't make a peace settlement as a united body. They each make their own terms. Ludendorff then says this is the end of the war and demands an armistice. The new German chancellor, Max von Baden, says, hang on, I thought we were trying to negotiate our way to the end of this war. I've only just become chancellor. The first thing you asked me to do is to negotiate an armistice. And Ludendorff says, We've got to act now. We've got to ask for a peace settlement on the basis of Wilson's 14 points. The politicians don't want to do it. And many of his own officers are flabbergasted. He convenes a meeting of the senior officers of the German army at the end of September. And they all go around saying, we can still hold in the West. We don't need to be forced into a settlement. One argument is Ludendorff's lost his nerve. There's a story that his doctor advised him at the end of September 1918 that he needed to relax by singing German folk songs in the bath and then to get less angst ridden. Obviously, he didn't take the advice. So, the first of the surrenders. Now, the point about Bulgaria's surrender and what it does to the central powers is that it breaks the link between Germany and Austria-Hungary on the one hand and the Ottoman Empire on the other, because the railway link that goes from Berlin or from Vienna to Istanbul, as it is today, goes through the Balkans. And that is now falling into Allied hands. As they clear Serbia, which has been under German and Austria-Hungarian occupation, there is no direct link any longer that keeps these allies as a geographical unit. And the Turks realize immediately that they must seek an armistice as well. So now one country's surrender is leading to another country's surrender, and the southern front is unraveling. Ludendorff says in his memoirs, the whole southern part 
of the alliance is being exposed, the soft underbelly, as Churchill would call it. But actually, there was no need to panic. It would have taken ages for these armies to get seriously into the central powers proper. The French general commanding in Macedonia says, I will be the first general since Napoleon in 1809 to enter Vienna. He hadn't got any chance of getting to Vienna until 1919. There was plenty of time for Germany to negotiate, but it didn't do so. So Germans have begun the armistice negotiations. The Austro-Hungarians know that. They have wanted to be out of the war. One of the problems on the Western Front is we can't really talk about one big battle, and certainly we can't talk about one big battle ending the war on the Western Front. But on each of the other fronts, there is, in inverted commas, a decisive battle. In Italy, the Italians achieve a victory at Vittoria Veneto. In Palestine, predominantly British imperial forces, including, of course, Australians, New Zealanders, Indians, achieve a victory at Megiddo, and this victory in Bulgaria. There's a direct link between military success and the negotiation of the armistices. They each happen sequentially, they happen independently. Even Austria and Hungary negotiate separately. So Austria concludes its armistice on the 3rd of November, and Hungary, which is now broken away from the empire, doesn't do so until after the Germans on the 13th of November. An armistice is a pause in the fighting. It is not a peace settlement. It does not mean the end of the war in itself. And there is a possibility that hostilities could have been renewed. Ludendorff, at the end of October, argues that they should be renewed. What makes these decisive is that the military terms are designed to achieve a military victory. So here in the West, at Compiègne, the Germans are effectively asked to give up so much equipment, so much railway rolling stock, and so many ships that they will not be able to resume fighting. And the Allies give to themselves the power to exploit militarily that German weakness. So they insist on securing the railway lines into Germany, the Rhine crossings, uh, the east bank of the Rhine, so that if the fighting does resume, they have got the whip hand. And they do the same thing with the Turks, the same thing with the Austrians, and the same thing with the Hungarians. The downside of this is that they are only military settlements. The politicians do not take part. It is Foch and a man called Wester Weems, who's the British First Sea Lord, speaking for the naval side of the war, in other words, a soldier and a sailor, who negotiate the peace settlement. The politicians are not there. He did Allenby commanding in Palestine when he asked the British Foreign Secretary what the terms of a peace settlement with the Ottoman Empire were to be, got a reply from the Foreign Office saying, we don't know. So there's a separation of the political from the military. And what that means is that nobody knows, including the defeated powers, but also the victorious powers, what the final peace settlements would look like. They are negotiated in Paris in 1919, and that process goes on right until 1923. The last of the peace treaties is with the new Turkish Republic, as it is by then, at Lausanne. And in those four years, Eastern and Central Europe, and much of North Africa, and much of Central Asia, continues fighting. One calculation is that four million lives are lost in fighting between 1919 and 1923 fighting that includes civil war in Poland, civil war in Russia. The consequence of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire is that all these groups are fighting for the post-war settlements. So the situation on the ground, militarily, is changing continuously between 1919 and 1923. The war with Germany ends on the 11th of November here in France, but it does not end in many other places because this war has become too big. You have been listening to From Amia to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, Professor Sir Hugh Strawn reflects on the last stop of the tour, the Glade of the Armistice, in the forest of Compiègne.